Hey, just a quick note to say that today's episode discusses the death of children in residential schools, and it might not be suitable for all listeners. I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. On Thursday, we heard some devastating news. The Tecumlups to Shikwepam First Nation announced that the remains of 215 children were found on the grounds of what was once Canada's largest residential school. Some were children as young as three years old. The discovery is proof of what many Indigenous leaders and residential school survivors have been saying for decades, that there are children who went to live in these government-funded schools and never came home who died and were buried in unmarked graves across the country, like this one in Kamloops, BC. The pain inflicted by residential schools, which were built to strip Indigenous children of their culture and where stories of abuse and neglect were common, is still fresh for survivors and their children. Today, we're going to talk about this tragedy and try to place it in a historical context. What was it like to go to a residential school? Why did so many children die? And what is the legacy of these institutions? So when I get to the mission, our clothes are being taken. And no matter how much we protest, no matter how much we cry, there's just, it doesn't matter. That's Phyllis Webstad. She's a residential school survivor who's on the show today. We're also going to speak with Stephanie Scott, who's the executive director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and Raymond Frogner, the head of archives at the center. That's today on The Decibel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm wondering if maybe we could start by having each of you introduce yourselves, maybe starting with Phyllis. Wade Huchweda, Phyllis Webstad Rensquest, Strachum Chatlum Stakwin. Hello, everyone. I'm Phyllis Webstad from the Kenna Creek Dog Creek First Nation. I am on the survivor circle for the NCTR. I attended uh, St. Joseph Mission here in Williams Lake, BC for one year when I turned six, and I am third generation Indian residential school survivor. My grandmother attended all of her 10 children, including my mother and myself. Thank you so much for coming on The Decibel. Stephanie, could you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? Bonjour, my name is Stephanie Scott. I'm the executive director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I'm also a mother, a grandmother, an auntie, born and raised in the traditional territory of Treaty 1. And I am a 60 scoop survivor. My mother also attended residential school here in Manitoba. Thank you. And Raymond, could I get you to tell us a bit about yourself? Raymond Notari Oscar Nigari Dors, Netasoskan, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. My name is Raymond Frogner. I'm the head of the archives for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Phyllis, could you tell us what you were thinking when you first heard the news last week that a mass grave of children had been found near the residential school in Kamloops? I found out when I was leaving the office at five o'clock and my son called me. He seen it on the uh, Kamloops news and so I I rushed home to watch. But um, I've known about unmarked graves for some time My aunt is the editor of Behind Closed Doors. She edited a book about stories about those that attended the Kamloops Residential School. And she shared with me that some of the people that she interviewed took her and showed her where the graves were. So we've all known, a lot of people know, and this is true across Canada, that people know where the graves are. And um, as Chief Manny Jules, former chief of Kamloops, said that uh, they knew that there were graves, but they were surprised at how many there were. And it's uh, been like I've been in crisis since then. I've had like four and a half hours of sleep last night Mm -hmm. and just trying to figure out what my next move is and what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go. And it's just a lot of a roller coaster ride since Thursday night. Raymond, what went through your mind? 
there's 139 schools in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, and it is known that almost every one of those schools had some kind of a makeshift unmarked grave site. That's known. And it's also been estimated that there's over 400 to 500 different kinds of fields like this, unmarked grave sites near these schools across the country. We're in the preliminary process of setting up a national program to investigate this. The Kamloops, to their credit, went forward and did their own research and made their own discoveries. And Stephanie, I wonder, did this come as a surprise to you that in Canada we could have such a thing? It's unfathomable that you have 215 children buried in a mass grave. I think what was telling to me was that I've worked also as the manager of statement gathering back during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I've been in every province and territory and gathered statements and sat with survivors, elders and knowledge keepers. And Phyllis is absolutely right. No matter where you go, everyone has stories about you know, the loss of children, babies that had been, you know, aborted and buried, placed on hilltops, left abandoned. I mean, this is not new. We work with this material every day. Those are our people. So your role is as the head of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and it's partly about gathering and archiving the stories of people like Phyllis and other residential school survivors and also of these 215 children, the center keeps a registry of all of the children that you've identified as never returning from residential schools because they died or they went missing. Could some of these children who were discovered buried at the Kamloops school site, could they be on this list? We do have a, a list of some of the names of the children. If you go to nctr.ca, you can look at the memorial website and you can plug in, you can search by names and or community. So it's there. So if there are 215 and we have 50 children, that's still 165 that we need to find mm -hmm. the details of who they are, where they came from, how they died, where they were buried within that grave. And, you know, I mean, children were sent from far and wide as well, too, not only specifically there, but they came from other communities. We need to find out who those babies are. How would children have died at these schools? You know, it's difficult to speculate. We do know that, you know, illness happened. Um, we've heard stories of really, truly horrific examples. But we know that, you know, some of those teenagers were getting pregnant. And we've heard stories about babies being born, stories about children being aborted. And so the ongoing work and research that we do, not only in exploration of the records, but community and, and listening to the survivors that are still with us today, you know, we're, we're going to piece that together. Sickness and particularly tuberculosis was the number one killer um, by far. A lack of infrastructure, a lack of funding, a lack of resources to care for the children um, is what led to their, their mortality rate, um, that they fundamentally had a, a much lower level of health care, nutrition, um, shelter than, than average Canadian children would have had. I mean, in many of these schools, or all of these schools essentially, we're um, expected at some point to be self-sufficient. Um, you know, children spent a lot of time working in, in gardens and, and fields, um, just raising crops for their, own, um, for their own schools. My grandmother lived to be 100. She passed in 2019. And I wrote down a lot of stuff when I would talk to her and she would tell me stories. And she said that um, ever since the white man got here, they've been trying to kill us. But the stories of our, the residential school here were babies when they were delivered. Uh, the girls would get pregnant by the brothers and the priests, and they would be kept on the fourth floor. It was called the infirmary, and they would disappear until they had their babies. And I actually had a conversation with somebody whose family, her sister had had a baby, and the baby, she heard it cry, it was taken away, and she never seen it again. So she spent her life looking at people that were that age, uh, wondering if that was her child. This school in Kamloops, it opened in 1890 as the Kamloops Industrial School, and later it became known as the Kamloops uh, Indian Residential School. And I wonder if you can tell me a bit about its history. So the Kamloops Industrial School was opened under Roman Catholic administration in 1890. It became the largest school in the Indian Affairs residential school system. 
The enrollment peaked in the early 1950s at 500. In 1910, the principal said the government did not provide enough money to feed the students properly. In 1969, the federal government took over the administration of the school, which no longer provided any classes and operated as a residence for students attending local day schools until 1978 when the residence was closed. And, and if we think about that, in today, in terms of society, I was born in 69. 78 is not that far ago. This is real. This is present. This is today. You know, our children are still being taken away. I was the 60s group taken from my mother's arms at birth. She was a residential school survivor. Child welfare system continues to take our children from our communities and our homes. This is very real, and it's today. Raymond, is there anything else about the Kamloops school that you think people should know or that made it maybe unique from other residential schools at all? Well, given its size and its uh, operation, this was one of those kind of catchment schools. The school actually received children from communities across British Columbia and even outside of the province. But the result of that was parents were forced to give up their children and um, have them sent to distant, distant institutions that they were never able to visit or, you know, to see their children. I think it's also important to note, too, that, you know, we don't hold every record of every child that went to that school. Uh, Raymond has been, you know, continuing that dialogue and conversation, and he should maybe share a little bit more about that and how we need to move forward, Raymond. Sure. For example, one of the issues that we are coming up against is it wasn't until 1935 in the Indian Act that an article was passed that outlined how a death of a child should be recorded at a school. Until then, there wasn't even a formal process to document a loss of a child. And in the records that we do hold of lost children, 49% of those records don't identify the cause of death. 23% of those records don't identify the gender of the child. So the records are, are at times very inconsistent, somewhat vague, and that's a reflection of the nature of how the records were kept. But I think that's also partly an indication of just how much care and concern was given by the instructors of those schools regarding whether they took the time and effort to actually record and document what happened to those children. We have been in negotiations with all of the church orders. There's approximately 88 church signatories for a final um, distribution of records that we feel we should hold. By far and away, it's the Catholic orders that still need to produce for us sets of records that indicate the history of those schools. Do you think the Roman Catholic Church may hold more information or clues to who these children are? Without question, yes, without question. And I just want to add to that as well, just in some of those records too, we actually have letters you know, in regard to administration that did not want to send those children's bodies home. It was too expensive. Mm -hmm. They laid them in paupers' graves. I mean, so can you imagine that you have a child, they've died, maybe you know, maybe you get that information, maybe you don't. And they could be buried anywhere because they didn't want to spend the money to, to give them a rightful ceremony and send them home. Phyllis, I wonder if we could spend some time talking about your experiences. So you mentioned your mother and grandmother both attended residential school when you were very young. You attended yourself, and now you lead an organization called the Orange Shirt Society, which works to support residential school survivors. Can you tell me the story that inspired the name of the group and tell me a bit about your experience going to residential school? My one-year experience at uh, St. Joseph Residential School, I always say that um, it was a walk in the park compared to my grandmother's experience. She went for 10 years from 1925 to 35. All of her 10 children, including my mother, my mother went for 10 years, me for one, and my son was also at the last operating residential school in Canada in 1996. So, I grew up with my grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve, and I stayed with her until I was 10, 9, 10 in, in that age range. And I used to think and believe that I must have decided to send myself there because Granny would not have been put in jail if she did not send me by then. So I thought, well, it must have been my decision, like, Granny, why would she send me? But now I've come to realize that it was the thing to do. When 
I turned six in July of 1973. I was being prepared just like any child would be to go to school. I was excited. Granny wanted me to have something new to wear, my cousin and I. So we were brought to town here to Williams Lake. And I remember choosing a shiny orange shirt. It had three buttons down the front and it had like a shoelace on the front and it was like a Nemo orange, uh, a shiny orange. So when I get to the mission, our clothes are being taken and no matter how much we protest, how no matter how much we cry, there's just, it doesn't matter. We didn't matter and that's where every child matters comes from. My shirt was taken and we were made to have a shower. At home, we didn't have electricity or running water. I'd never had a shower in my life. And all of a sudden, the water's coming out of the walls. And a lot of us are like that, just screaming and not knowing like what is going on. That's where I learned that my life depended on me, that there was nobody there to help me, that we were, my cousins and I, band together, and we relied on each other, you know. Raymond and Stephanie, you've also heard the stories of many residential school survivors. Raymond, could you tell me how similar those stories are to Phyllis's story? How are children treated at these schools? Well, effectively, as one person has put it, it was death by civilization. It was a program, a social engineering program to remove Indigenous cultures from the children in order to produce, you know, a settler child with a you know, the appropriate work ethic, the appropriate spiritual beliefs, the skills required for uh, an industrial economy or an agrarian economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's countless, countless stories that are very similar to Phyllis's story. Yeah, there are stories right across the country. You know, these schools ran before Canada became a country with the last school closing in 1996. You know, unfortunately, we have heard numerous survivors, many, many survivors recall experiences of emotional, physical sexual harm with students, you know, taking place at this school. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis, like Raymond said, these schools were created, and many people in power have said at the time also said this, they were created to separate children from their heritage, language, culture, their parents. How do you think going to residential school and having a mother and a grandmother who also went influenced your Indigenous identity? The language, my Shipwetmouth language was not taught to me. I can pick up words and I understand, but I, I cannot hold a conversation. So for the first time in four generations, children in my family, my grandchildren are living under the same roof as their mother and their father. Granny didn't have that. Mom didn't have that. I didn't have that. And my son didn't have that. And Stephanie, um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more to the long-term impacts of the time people spent in residential schools, especially, I guess, from your perspective as a 60s scoop survivor. Yeah, so my mother attended residential schools, and what had happened is um, when she was ready to give birth, she went to from her home community to Rosa River to give birth in Winnipeg. She was a 16-year-old girl, had me. She got to hold me once, and I was gone. I didn't meet her again until I was 28 years old. You know, I didn't grow up with my culture. I didn't grow up with my language. It set me on a path of destruction, you know, self-harm, addictions. And it wasn't until I had my children, I had twin girls at the age of 23, where all of a sudden I realized that I was no longer responsible for myself because I could have very well been, you know, ended up dead on in a field somewhere just because of you know, what was happening in our communities. So I'm in the process of reclaiming and I've been working on that for, you know, 25 years now. And I still only know a few words of my language. I only know a little bit of my culture. I've been exposed to elders and knowledge keepers across this country. And so those impacts are long term. Mm -hmm. My daughters learned a little bit about their culture. My grandsons know a few words. They know how to smudge. They can dance. They've got hoops given to them as gifts. So they'll hopefully one day soon be a hoop dancer. And, and we can do that now. And nobody's going to stop us. And we're reclaiming and, and we're empowered to do what we were supposed to meant to do all of these years, you know, since time memorial. Raymond, do you want to add anything? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's first of all about acknowledgement, right? Um, we are what we choose to remember, but we are also what we choose to forget. And we're at a moment in time in Canada where we're starting to realize that there needs to be an acknowledgement of this social engineering project that was residential schools. 
once that acknowledgement is complete and, and affected, we can then begin to do the hard work of building new relationships across settler and indigenous communities. Like my mom's experience was similar to, to Steph's. She, she attended Shasbury Mission and at 16 became pregnant and was, so was expelled. Mm-hmm. I never learned this history until I was in my 30s when my half-brother actually tracked me down. Wow. These are the silences that um, we're trying to acknowledge at this point in time. Stephanie, a lot of people have pointed out over the weekend and many people have said for years that the legacy of residential schools lives on in the way that Indigenous children continue to be separated from their families to this day. As of 2016, more than 52% of children under 14 in foster care were Indigenous, even though Indigenous children make up only 7.7% of children under 14 in Canada. I wonder if you could help us understand the connection between residential schools and why Indigenous children are in care at such disproportionate rates to this day. I think understanding the the true life history and, and the ongoing raping and stealing of children across this country uh, through child welfare. It's not only the fact that, you know, our communities live with the trauma, but Indigenous people are a business. Can you imagine if we all became healthy, there would be no more child welfare. A lot of people would be out of jobs. And I think it's absolutely key and crucial that people understand that. We need to take responsibility for our children, not other systems, not other communities, not other nations. The federal government absolutely needs to help and be responsible and quit fighting us in government. You know, mm-hmm. let us do the job. We we are mothers. We are aunties, fathers, grandparents, grandfathers. We can take care of our children. And we should have been doing that from the very beginning. And I can certainly tell you, we'd be in a way better state had that happened. The news of these unmarked graves has had a profound reaction across the country. There were vigils held across Canada. We've heard statements from many politicians, you know, including the Prime Minister, the Crown uh, Indigenous Relations Minister, Carolyn Bennett. Flags have been lowered at federal buildings. What do you all make of the government's response? It's not enough. The acknowledgement and standing in solidarity with us is important. In 2019, the government's budget included $33 million dedicated to help identify and locate the children I know that that money has not moved into the hands of communities and organizations that can continue to do that work. So government, come on, move on it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that the flags were eventually, they're being lowered now. But what I want to know is, is the Prime Minister of Canada going to come to the site and witness where the children are buried. His statement, that's not enough. And I would like to see him there in Kamloops. And I know you're going to Kamloops. What are you expecting once you once you arrive? When anyone passes in Shuwap Mkuluk, Shushwap country, we have a fire for four days. And today is that last day. Every night at seven is drumming and prayers. So I plan to be there with my eldest aunt and my mother tonight and maybe my two eldest grandchildren and my son to say prayers and to be there and to uh, witness the drumming for the fourth and final day of the fire. People from all the nations that uh, are affected are converging upon Kamloops right now. So I uh, look forward to the drive with my aunt to, as I, I want to find words in our language. So I'm going to be asking my auntie and my, my mom just for a few words to describe what's going on. It's sad. It's awful. Like all the English words, but our languages are so descriptive that I want to find the word that, um, I'm glad as well. There has to be a word where you say, I'm just so sad that this has happened. But then at the same time, it's uh, bringing, as one of my friends said, she said, it ignited the truth. And that's what's happening across Canada right now. Raymond, the news of this mass grave is forcing people to confront a very dark part of Canadian history. In the face of this truth, what does reconciliation look like to you? 
Well, I think of uh, Elder Harry Bone, who's our spiritual guide, who's always reminding us that um, it's not always a story of house of horrors. Indigenous people have persevered. They're still here. They're thriving in their communities. They still have cultures that are vibrant and can be you know, celebrated and honored. Stephanie, do you have any thoughts you want to add? What does reconciliation look like to you? Reconciliation to me is that the truth has been revealed, that we all understand the truth. It's going to be unsettling. It's going to be alarming. And then when I'm able to walk into a store, I'm not followed by the staff as I'm shopping for my groceries, that my twin daughters are safe to walk the streets of their own city and country without having the fear of it being taken away, potentially missing and murdered, and that my grandchildren hold their language at that gift that was they should have been born with. That's what reconciliation is to me. This work of missing children and unmarked burials needs to happen while as many survivors as possible are still here on this earth. So I'm glad that uh, Dekem Loops has taken the initiative. They had to apply for a grant to do the work. That's not right. There is money sitting there from the government to help with this work, and they had to apply for a grant. There will come a day when there will be no survivors left in Canada. I want to leave this earth knowing that this chapter is coming to a close. I'm 54. It might take 20 years or more to deal with this. So by the time I leave this earth, I want to be, me and other survivors, to be somewhat at peace with this, that we do not pass it to future generations to deal with, that it be dealt with. And we're having a mass grieving across Canada. Everybody I talk to is grieving and trying to come to grips with this. And it's uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous are grappling with this right now. Even though we knew these children were here, we still have a process to go through to grieve. And uh, many are angry right now, are getting angry. And that's part of the process of of grieving. And then finally, we'll uh, come to acceptance at some point not right away, it may take years, but um, I am thankful that this has happened. I hope it's treated as a crime scene, that it's investigated, and I think it's up to the families of these children to decide what to do, whether they decide to leave them there or whether they decide to take them home. That should be the family's decision, a collaborative decision on what needs to happen. I want to say... I'm very thankful to all of you for taking the time and being so generous with your stories during a time of mass grieving. Thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for today. I'm Tamara Kendacker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovic. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much to our guests, Stephanie Scott, Executive Director, and Raymond Frogner, Head of Archives, both at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. You can find them at nctr.ca. And thank you to Phyllis Webstad, Executive Director of the Orange Shirt Society, which runs Orange Shirt Day every September 30th. The Indian Residential School Survivor Society operates a 24-7 crisis phone line for any survivor. You can call them at 1-866-925-4419. And if you want to let us know what you thought of this episode or any other, you can email us at thedecibel at globeandmail.com. Make sure you're following us on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.